Це просто круто! І сьогодні у нас чудова нагода зустрітися з дуже-дуже талановитою людиною, дуже розумною, дуже прямою, дуже прозорою, з просто перфектним відчуттям гумору. І я думаю, що наступний час ви будете мати великі задоволення. Гіл Пенчіна! Hi, so my name is Gil. It's nice to be in Ukraine. This is my first trip to Kiev, so I've been a little bit of a tourist today, seeing a, a beautiful city, so thank you all for coming. Um, they asked me to talk a little bit about startups and big companies and some of the differences. And to be honest with you, normally I, I talk about startups. So most of my presentation is really about startups, which I think are much cooler than big companies. But uh, I, I will try to talk about some of the ways in which I find they're very different as we go along. But if it, uh, if it gets too boring because it's all about startups, raise your hand and wave at me and I'll, I'll try to talk more about how it's different from big companies. So a little bit about me. Um, if I can make this work. Yes. So th this is my, uh, my AngelList profile, which is sort of like my resume now. So I've worked at a few different companies. I was one of the early people at eBay. And then um, I met this very interesting guy named Jimmy Wales, who founded Wikipedia. And he asked me to go run his second Wikipedia, which is a company called Wikia, which has uh, actually a number of sites in Ukrainian. And uh, I ran that company for about five years. And more recently, I've, I've been working with a company called Fastly, uh, also in the US which is uh, a CDN, it's an infrastructure company that helps make the internet work better. So that's, that's a little bit about me. And then you can see here also some of my investments. I was an early investor in PayPal and LinkedIn. And if you haven't tried it yet, you should try a site called SongPop, which lets you compete to see who can find uh, the best music. And uh, I've probably done about 60 investments and been involved in, I don't know, maybe a total of 100 companies in the last 10 years. So I spend a lot of time with startups. And, and it's really, frankly, a lot more fun than, than anything else I do. So oh, a little closer. Make sure, can people in the back here, or should I keep yeah. talking about it? OK. Um, so, I've been in a big company, uh, eBay, although actually when I joined it, it wasn't that big. When I joined eBay, it was about 70 or, or maybe 80 people. Uh, and when I left, it was 15,000 people, which was really pretty crazy. Because I remember sitting in this small building when we were 80 people or 100 people and saying, what would we ever do if we had 200 people? Like, what would they do? There's just not that much to do. And, and now it's, it's 15,000. And uh, I left because I was managing a team of about 400 people. And I found that at a big company, you spend most of your time looking at numbers and listening to people complain and eating pastries and meetings. And uh, it really just wasn't very fun. I didn't feel like I was doing anything. I was sitting in meetings and listening to reports and looking at numbers. And so I quit and I joined this crazy little company called Nokia, which was six people. Uh, living all over the world at the time. They didn't even have an office. And uh, Wikia also grew and became about 150 people, at which point it started to feel big again. And so I quit and joined a one-person company uh, as the second sort of co-founder. So, you know, I find there are many differences between big companies and small companies, but one of the reasons I think it's, it's cool to be building this entrepreneurial community here, here in Ukraine is it's become very easy to build a startup. It used to be that you needed a factory and you needed a hundred salespeople and it was very expensive to start a company. And now it's really become very cheap. So if I think about you know this access, the access to starting a business, it's gotten much, much easier. And I'm gonna talk a bit about you know, the reasons people do startups. It's easier, it's it's the ego, you know, it's sort of exciting to be in charge, and, and it's the opportunity that it's gotten easier. To, to find the opportunity. So 
you've all probably read somewhere in the newspaper about the cloud and infrastructure and Google and Amazon. Um, and it's gotten very easy now to do cloud computing. And to put this in perspective, when I was at eBay, we used to buy these machines. This was a Sun E10K. This machine was a big computer. Each one of them cost $10 million. And we would buy a lot of them. Like, they would, they would bring trucks of them to eBay. And then, you know, that was, you know, starting a company in 1995 or 98. And by, like, 2002, you would buy $10,000 machines or $5,000 machines. And uh, now, you just plug into Amazon and you connect to it. And uh, I actually helped a friend start a company. And to get the company started, to register the company, to get the website built, and to get to the first customer, costs $200. And I remember thinking like 10 million, 10,200, wow, like it's really easy now to start a company. It's very cheap, uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money up front. Um, similarly, we used to spend a lot of money on this horrible software called Oracle, which was a database. Um, and I remember buying lots and lots and lots of Oracle. At, I think it was $25,000 per machine to buy the software. And now uh, my friend Martin was the CEO of MySQL, and he would say the software is free. I don't understand why anybody would ever buy Oracle ever again. So now not only is the hardware you know, the machine very cheap, but the software is more than cheap. It's basically free. I mean, most companies now start entirely with open source software, which is you know really cool. Um, and then you know when I was you know at eBay. There were 150 million internet users, so it took a long time to build a big business because there just weren't very many people on the internet. And this was globally, right? The US number at the time might have been 15 or 20 million people. Um, and then, you know, five, six years later, it's a billion people, and now it's, two, it's over two billion people accessing the internet every day. So now when you think about, boy, if I could only get 1% of the internet, right? 1% of the internet used to be a million people. And now it's like 20 million people. And so you see more and more people who build like an iPhone app and have 10 million users in a year, which is crazy. Like it took us five years to get there. So it's so that the size of the opportunity is so big. And so when I think about this access, it's so many people and so cheap to get started that I sit here going, well, why would I you know, ever join a big company when I can you know, go do this myself? Um, and ultimately, in Silicon Valley, we talk about this a lot, right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to achieve global dominance. We want to own everything. Um, and it used to be very expensive to do global dominance. And you would buy all this expensive stuff, and you would build big offices. And now the strategy for a startup for global dominance is this. I achieve global dominance in the basement of my mother's house. It's kind of a mess, but you know, this is international world headquarters. Uh, for the first year, right? So if I don't have to pay rent, and I don't have to buy servers, and I don't have to buy software, like, all I have to do is pay for a business card, and I'm, I'm in business. Um, so that, and you know, it sounds like a joke, but it, it really isn't. Uh, and then ego, you know, it, it's, it used to be that to be the CEO of Cisco or IBM was really cool, and now it's really cool to be a startup CEO, and it, I find that actually it matters a lot to have these sort of incubators out here because it, it gives you a place where you have uh, people who think it's cool, where you have a community who support you, um, and, and it becomes sort of a fun place and you get to go in here because people come to talk to. So ego actually matters more than you think because it, it, people want to feel important and they want, you know. So I find in Silicon Valley you, you have these big companies and People who are at this big company have made uh, made some money when the company goes public, and then their version of ego is they decide, ah, I'm going to become an angel investor. This will be cool. And I actually had breakfast with a guy who's done ten angel investments this year, and I, you know, was just chatting over breakfast, and I asked him, you know. Like, when you started investing in these companies, did you have a plan? Was there a, you know, how did you decide to do it? And he goes, oh yes, no, I have a plan. I have a 10 point list of things I'm trying to accomplish. And I was like, really? That's very interesting because most of the people I meet from these companies, they're like, I don't know, it's cool, I do it, because it's fun. Uh, I get to meet people. 
And uh, he goes, no, I have a 10 point plan. So I said, can you show it to me? He goes, absolutely. And he pulls it out. And nowhere on this 10 point plan for this investor is make money, which I thought was really cool. Like, I want him to invest in all my companies then. Uh, but what is he doing? He's trying to meet people. He's trying to learn. He's trying to get invited to cool parties. Like, it's really, it's all about ego. And then to make it worse, we have all these uh, super angels that you, you may read about in the tech press, and they raise money from all sorts of, of you know, rich people just to put even more money into startups. And so you have this whole ecosystem in the valley of people who are giving money to startups because it's fun, because it's cool, because they sort of get to be part of it. And, and that starts you know, with people like you going and starting things, and then when, you, when you're successful, turning around and becoming crazy people like me. Um, and it is fun, right? Like I was over at the Happy Farm and they're doing all sorts of cool stuff and I was with Naval and AngelList and he's having all these cool camps and uh, there's just people running around and everyone's young and you're not working with a bunch of 50 year old people who wear suits, you're working with 20 year old people who wear shorts and it's a lot more fun. Uh, and frankly it's a lot more energy, but I, I enjoy startups because I like the energy, I like working until 2 in the morning, I tried, you know, someone was, was joking uh, about my sleep pattern, which is I don't sleep, uh, you know, I just stay up all the time, and, and it's, you know, people, I, I feed off the energy of you and, and what you guys are doing, uh, and that opportunity, right, so this is the sort of the third leg of this, of this triangle for startups. Um, it's so cool, right, that it, it used to be you had to do marketing, and what did marketing mean? It meant I bought TV ads and I would tell you how cool my soap is. And then I would try to convert you into using my soap, and then I would try to get you to keep using my soap. But now with social media, people find me, and they convert their friends, and they stay because all their friends are there. Right, like, I can't leave Facebook now. I can't, all my friends are there. Um, I can't leave Dropbox. If I left Dropbox, I don't like all of the files from all the people that I share with are all on Dropbox now. Like I can't leave. They they didn't do advertising to get me on the Dropbox. My friends keep set, kept sending it to me until finally I was like, okay, fine, I will use Dropbox. It's really annoying. Um, so all of these social media, you know, you you there's now you know you, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or you know, app stores or iTunes. There's an incredible number of ways to get free customers and to just get started. And I was talking to someone today who was saying, oh, we're going to put our thing on Google Play and I have a friend there who will give me some promotion. You, know, you just don't spend money like you used to. You used to start a company and you'd spend a million dollars just on advertising or $10 million. I mean, at eBay, we would spend hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising. And now you don't have to, right? Your friends are your, are your marketing. Your product is the marketing. Um, the press is the market, right? So it, it makes so many things so easy. Um, and, you know, so I think about it in terms of the capital efficiency, right? I, I didn't have to pay for hardware. I don't have to pay for marketing. My office is the basement of my mother's house. Um, and you can look at companies like Atlassian, which went public, and the first time they raised investor money, the company was valued at over a billion dollars and had over a hundred million dollars in revenue. And, you know, you can look at, you know, Angry Birds, very similarly, built a huge company without very much investment. GitHub was another one, for those of you who are, who are programmers, right? The first time GitHub raised money, they raised $100 million. I mean, like, that's crazy. Most of the time you raise money, you raise $100,000, or $500,000, or a million dollars. But $100 million was the first check they took from an investor. Uh, I'm an investor in, in We Heart It. It was one guy in Brazil working out of his apartment, and he almost turned the website off because it was getting too expensive to run on Amazon. Because he had 800 million page views a month to his website and no revenue. And he was like, oh, I might, you know, maybe I do donations, I don't know what to do. And so he ended up raising money. Um, you know, Airbnb, three guys sitting around selling cereal to fund their startup. Right? I mean, it was amazing how much they accomplished with so little. Um, I was meeting with the Pinterest founder a couple weeks ago. You know, this is a top 10 website in almost every country in the world. Does anyone here use Pinterest? 
Any hands? A few people. Okay. Um, so, as of about six months ago, there were 30 people. Right? When eBay was that size, we had like a thousand people. I mean, there were 30 people in a small office in San Francisco, and they were running one of the 10 biggest websites in the internet. Like, it's just crazy how easy this stuff, this stuff is to do now. Um, it's also much easier to collect money. So whether it's Recurly and Chargeify who help you bill every month if you have subscription billing, or PayPal or Stripe that let you collect money for one thing, you know, it's, it's gotten very easy to collect money. So you can get advertising revenue now, you can ask people to pay, you can do freemium on iPhone and Android. There's so many more ways to get paid for what you do. Um, and again, I, I sort of look at it and I go, you know, it's really easy. So the first internet company I started um, was a website for people who like to travel. And uh, I started it myself, and my only cost at the time was AOL, so I was paying $20 a month for my AOL bill. And I, I wrote all the code myself, I learned how to code in class. And then I, I started a newsletter. I said, if you want my cool newsletter, it's $15 a year. And there was no PayPal, and there was none of, these, none of these services. And so I gave people my home address, and they would mail me checks for $15. And I remember you know, every day I would open the mail, and I'd be like, oh, it's cool, I have $30 today. Like, this is so fun. Um, and all of these checks are addressed to the name of my website, smartflyer.com, which doesn't exist anymore. And then after I had about 100 checks sitting on my desk, I realized that my name is not smartflyer.com, and I can't cash these checks. So I go to the bank and I, and I say, I, I want to open a bank account for smartflyer.com. They say, we need all your business paperwork. I said, I don't have any business paperwork. I said, people are paying you and you don't have a business. I was like, yes. So the first business I started, I actually started because I had to cash the checks sitting on my desk. So I go to the government, uh, and I, I put out in the name of my business, and I have to go to the newspaper and advertise that I'm starting a business. And I finally get all the paperwork, and I come back to the bank, and I say, aha, I have, you know, I have all the paperwork. Now I can open a bank account. And they say, OK, you should open a checking account, uh, which costs more than a simple bank or savings account. I said, no, I'm cheap. I want a savings account. They said, no, you're a business. You need a checking account because you have to pay all your suppliers and your employees. I said, yeah, I don't have any of that. Like, I don't pay anyone. Like, all the, like, money just comes in. No money goes out. And the woman looks at me and she's like, you don't understand how this works, do you? And I was like, well, one of us doesn't. It's not, it's not clear to me who, right? And so my first website only had money coming in, right? Because it was in my basement and it was me as the programmer and me as the marketing team. And I didn't even have business cards, right? And so I was a year into it before I actually did the business paper. And that, you know, it's so opposite to how big companies think. And if, you know, if you go to work at a big company, they have rules, they have policies, they know how to do things. They do things the right way. When you're a startup and you're young, you don't know what to do, and you generally do everything the wrong way. Or even better, you just don't do it at all because you didn't know you're supposed to do it. Right, and so I actually end up, uh, like at Fastly, uh, we have these board meetings now with our investors where they say, you should do this. And I say, no, really, we, we're not going to do it. And they're like, you have to do it. I'm like, no, I, I don't think I have to do it. Uh, and so we get in a fight. Like, uh, in, I don't know why, but it's Silicon Valley. Everyone wants you to sign a non-disclosure agreement when you talk to them. It says, you'll keep all my information secret. And they hire lawyers to, to change these agreements and make sure they're safe and do all these things. And lawyers are expensive. I don't like paying for lawyers. So anytime I'm talking to a big company and they ask me to sign this document, I just sign it. And so I'm telling the board members, yeah, we, we just sign them. We don't really read them. They're kind of stupid. And they look at me and they're like, you're an idiot. Like, that's crazy. Like, you don't have a lawyer? I was like, no, lawyers are expensive. They're like, you have to review these documents before you sign them. I'm like, no, I, I really don't. Uh, if I was at eBay, they'd fire me for that, right? And here they just sort of get mad at me, but 
what, what can they do? So, you know, it's this ability to sort of not have to do things that I find so lovely about startups. Um, so I'll give you another story about you know, how crazy startup land is. So this is a, a company that, that I'm an investor in now called AngelList. I don't know, have any of you heard of AngelList? Anyone? Okay. 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 Um, so Naval started AngelList because there are lots of people investing and there are lots of people raising money and he thought you know, maybe there would be a simple way to connect them. And it has become pretty cool. And you know, people are talking about AngelList is super cool and all these things. And I, I had never used AngelList. Uh, and I thought, you know, it would be fun to try. So one night at about, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12 at night, I had this awesome idea for this payment business I wanted to start. Like, it came to me at this moment of lightning. And I spent the next few hours writing it down and drawing up little, you know, pictures of what it looked like. And then around 2, 3 a.m., I went on AngelList and I said, I am going to, you know, go raise money for my startup. So this was my startup. I called it Nuco because I had no fucking idea what the name was. <laughs> and it asked me for a picture, and I didn't have a picture, so I went on the internet, and I found a photo of a stealth submarine. Because that's cool. So I put that up. And then they said, what market are you addressing? And I said, well, I need a really big number. So I'm addressing the $15 trillion business market. Business. Russian style. Um, so if you read the World Bank reports, the world economy is about 40 trillion. Uh, consumer spending is about 60% of that, business spending is 40% of it. So I basically said I'm going to capture all business spending on everything everywhere. <laughs> but if I'm doing payments between businesses, it's actually possible that I might get all business money going through my system. So it's not entirely not true, it's just sort of ridiculous. Uh, and then I said, hey, I'm starting it, and it's in stealth, shh. But I'll tell you it's financial and it's business. And I woke up the next morning and I had 300 followers. And by the end of a week, I had 400 followers. And they're all emailing me. So I got about 450 emails in the first week for this idea that I've been thinking about for about three hours. I have no team. I certainly don't have a product. I don't have a business plan. Um, and all my friends come in and they're like, amazing team. Uh, I'm in. Uh, very promising idea. Uh, like, my friends are idiots. But it's cool because it makes. Um, my, my joke is what I had done without realizing it, because at 3 a.m. I wasn't really thinking very clearly, is I had created a bar with a big red rope line outside and no windows. And there's a long line of people standing outside this bar with no windows, it's all black, with no signs, because it's self, it's all black. And anyone who drives by this bar immediately stops because they want to see what's so cool that there's all these people waiting in front of this shitty building. Right? This, I had created this sort of gestalt of it must be cool because it's secret. It must be cool because no one else knows about it. Uh, it must be cool because everyone else wants to know what the fuck is it. Um, and I was getting emails from people saying, hey, so-and-so wants to introduce, uh, wants to introduce your, uh, themselves to you um, to, to learn about your company, what can you tell me about it? I'm like, nothing. So I, I started responding to the emails, and uh, this was the result. So about a third of the 450 emails that I answered were from a kid who is 25 to 29 years old and now works at the Venture Capital Fund, and their job is to have coffee with people. They don't get to make any decisions. Their job is just to collect information, have coffee, meet with people. The people who actually make the decisions are called partners, and to get money from them, you have to meet with the entire group of partners and present. It's sort of like, uh, you know, almost like an execution. You're standing there in front of all the people with guns, and uh, if you say anything wrong, you're shot. So, so I get 150 emails from kids who want to have coffee. I like coffee, but not that much. 
Um, so I start building because I'm not prepared and I don't have a process and I don't have a rule book. I start building template emails because I'm responding to the same fucking email so many times that I'm now building documents with my standard answers like a good customer support organization would. And so I have my venture capital associate email that says, thank you so much for your interest in Nuco. Uh, I'm very impressed with fill in the blank venture fund super cool venture fund. Um, unfortunately, I don't drink coffee, but uh, I would be happy to come and have a meeting in front of the whole partnership anytime you want. No one brings you in to meet with the whole partnership with the whole, without doing a whole bunch of bullshit first. Um, and so I got no replies from that, which was perfect, because I would like to be polite, I don't want to be rude, but what if VC is going to give me money for an idea where I don't even have a one-page description of the idea yet? I just have a bunch of scribbles. Like, I'm not ready for venture funds. I'm smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough to get venture money right now for Nuco, my submarine building payment service. Um, so then in this other group called Seed Funds, these are the guys who raise $5 million or $10 million, and all they do is invest in startups. They really like to be early. And uh, most of them don't know anything about payments, don't know anything about business to business. I'm not even sure what they know about, but they, they have a friend who gives them $10 million. Um, so for each of them, I had you know, a fairly similar email, but I would say, you know, my template email says, thank you so much for your interest. Um, please tell me what other investments you have done in business and payment services so I can understand why you're so excited about my business. That got me four good meetings. 150 emails, four good meetings. Um, a lot of people would have had 150 meetings, right? So I'm very focused on trying to understand and analyze and sort of make my life easier and do less work because at a startup, the whole team is me, right? So if I take 150 meetings, there goes June, July, and August. Um, then the last third was actually angels. It was, it was very interesting to me to realize of the 450 emails, only about 150 were actually angels, and yet this is angel list. So it's actually angel venture seed fund list. Who knew? Um, and about 50 of them were actually pretty cool, connected angels, people who were smart, people who've done a lot, people who knew about payments. There were another 50 that were like my friend with the list of 10 things. He's like, Angel, it's cool, I want to do it. And you know, I made money at Facebook, and so I'm smart. Um, and then there was my favorite category, what I call scary dumb money. Um, the nice version of scary dumb money was the guy who emails me and says, I work at Credit Suisse in Chicago, and I want to be an angel but I only have $10,000. Will you let me invest only $10,000? And I tell him, you know, so I actually send him back an email and I say, you know, I really don't think it's a good idea if you only have $10,000 that you invested in my really bad idea. And he goes, no, 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 no. What I mean is I've set a budget that I can afford to lose $10,000. Like I won't lose my home or my car. Like, I've set aside $10,000, I want to become an angel investor, and I, I trust you. you. You don't know me, but okay. Uh, that was scary money. Then there was, well, that, that would actually, to be fair, that was dumb money. Dumb money is like, I don't know, I want to put money in. Scary dumb money is the guy who emails me on AngelList, and I go look at his profile, and he manages monies for doctors in the middle of America. This is the part of America we call the flyover country because you never go there. You fly over from New York to San Francisco and back. You never want to stop in Wisconsin. Uh, so he manages money for like dumb doctors in bad parts of America. And so I write him back a note and I say, look, I looked at your angelist profile. You know, I want to be polite. You don't know anything about payments. You don't know anything about startups. You don't know anything about me. And I'm not going to tell you anything about the business. So, I think it's a really bad idea for you to invest. But thank you so much for your interest. So, about an hour later, I get an email from him, and he says, what is your address? 
And I'm thinking, letter bomb. He's going to send me a bomb, or he's going to send me a pipe of shit or something. But I want to be polite. So I write him back and I say, why do you need my address? And he says, I have a check for $100,000 sitting on my desk. I want to know where to mail it. That's kind of scary. <laughs> and we were talking yesterday at the Happy Farm about, like, you try to raise money, you want the best money you can get, but ultimately you just want money. And so, you know, I have my pyramid of money, and at the top is really smart angels who are super connected, and in the middle is nice people and friends of mine who have money, and then below that is the guy from Credit Suisse, who at least seems like a nice guy, and at the bottom of the list is the guy who manages money from doctors. Because I'm pretty sure he will sue me if anything goes wrong ever, and will probably show up at my house angry if I lose the hundred that like. He just, he's kind of crazy, and, and I don't really want to take money from crazy people, but ultimately, if I need the money, I will put up with the crazy people. I'm just lucky enough that, in this case, I can really say, no, thank you, but no. Um, so you look at all this, and I ultimately come away with, there's really never been a better time to join or, or start a company because of all of these reasons. Um, and I argue, much like my company, that a year after my website was up, when I had a stack of checks on my desk, it actually became a company. A startup is not actually a company. A startup is a hypothesis, it's a project, it's an idea, and you spend a lot of time trying to turn your idea into a business, and it's funded by adrenaline junkies, people who love energy. Um, and so ultimately, the success is about keeping costs very low so that you can continue to run experiments and learn. So my, start, my first startup, my little travel site, my first project was this newsletter, and I made $15 from each person who signed up. And then my next project was Amazon Affiliate Links, which made me $25 after a year and a half. So that one was not such a good project. And then my next project was helping people buy and sell miles. So you have a bunch of frequent flyer miles, there's some fat business traveler who likes to travel first class, I connect the two of you and I keep a commission. So my second year of school, um, with my miles marketplace working, I made $80,000 on my business that cost me $20 a month to run. And I was like, the internet, it's pretty cool. I like this. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons I was able to, to join eBay is, you know, when I, when I joined eBay out of school, they said, do you understand what we do? And I said, do, do I understand? Like, I've been doing it, right? And so another thing I often tell people is that the best way to be good at something is to just start doing it. Like, don't wait for permission. Don't wait for somebody to give you the job. I decided the internet was cool, so I started doing internet. I didn't know what the fuck that meant. I just started doing things. And I learned, and people thought that was awesome. Right? Um, in, in 98, when eBay went public, and I suddenly realized I had some money, I decided someday in the future I might want to be a venture capitalist. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll start investing in companies, and I will learn how to be a venture capitalist. And now, you know, 10 years later, I'm an investor in 60 companies and I go meet with venture capitalists, and they're all like, you should totally join us, that would be great. And it's just, it's kind of really nice, right? But it turns out I, I was wrong, I spent 10 years educating myself, and I don't actually want to be a venture capitalist, because they sit in rooms with coffee and food and listen to people, and I like doing things. Um, but, you know, you can make these simple tests, you can try things at home, it's not hard to start a project. It takes a little bit of paperwork to start a company, but these things are very easy to do. And it's kind of fun to you know, have your name tag be founder and CEO. In fact, one of my favorite guys I met at one of these networking events, his, found, his, his business card says, founder, chairman, CEO, and president. <laughs> and uh, my friend, who I show this business card to, looks at it and he goes, small penis. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe he's got a little bit of an ego problem. I don't know. Uh, 
So they asked me to, to give some tips also, mantras. Uh, if you haven't read or heard about Lean Startup, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about ultimately is Lean Startup concepts. It's the idea that you should be able to, to build low-cost uh, businesses. You should be able to try things. Uh, you know, an example of the Lean Startup model is don't build a software product. Put up a blog saying that you can buy the software with a form letting you put in your credit card. And then when they click, I want to buy this, and they put in their name and their credit card, you take them to a page that says, oh, I'm sorry, my credit card machine doesn't work. Oops. Because um, it's OK to find out if anyone will buy it before you go build it. Right? These are the sort of things that I love, because ultimately, when we start companies, when we do these projects, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn. We're trying to find out if my crazy idea actually is something people want. Uh, and in the case of my startup, I spent three months on it. I pulled together five people who are nights and weekends, no one quit their job. And after three months, I had $2 million that investors wanted to give us to go do this project. And I decided not to do it because as I talked to customers, it was very interesting to me that the investors thought it was a really cool idea. Employees, or soon-to-be employees, thought it was an awesome idea. And customers were like, eh, I don't know, it's kind of nice. Um, and I call it my, my sock drawer problem. I had the, the guy at Google when I was at Wikia, he was calling me saying, we have this iGoogle thing and Wikia has an iGoogle app, app and we want to help you make it better. And, I can work with you on it and help you make it more awesome. I said to him, yeah, I really don't care. He goes, no, you don't understand. Like, I can help you for free. It won't cost any money. I'm like, yeah, but I don't care. He's like, of course you care. Like, you have the product and da, 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 da. And finally, you know, to explain to him what my customers and my business payment system were telling me, is I said, it's like you show up at my apartment and you tell me, you have black socks and white socks in one drawer, and every morning you have to find two that are, that are the same color. I will organize your sock drawer for you. I will put the socks together in pairs, and it's free. And I go, yeah, I really don't care. So the enemy of a startup is often that my awesome idea is actually a sock organizing idea. Like, I have a problem because I show up with one white sock and one black sock and people think I'm an idiot. But I don't actually care enough to fix the problem. So Lean Startup is all about learning whether or not anyone else cares about your problem. Um, design is another big thing, right? Making things easy, making them simple, making them pretty. Um, think about Groupon, which is you know a billion dollar company. The first version of Groupon was on a blog. And they put a blog post saying, $20 of pizza for $10. Email us if you want it. I mean, and then they would do money by PayPal. Like, I mean, it was a joke. No one in Silicon Valley would ever invest in something that stupid and broken. But it worked, and they kept doing it. And after it worked a bunch of times, they built a product that sucked us. Um, another one that, that I fight with investors on all the time, so Fastly is a company I, I helped start. I fight with investors all the time who say, you have to be safe, you have to be cautious, you have to watch out for things. So we let you use, we have computers all over the world, and we let you basically rent them. You can use our computer to do things. So these computers cost a lot of money, and we spend money on buying them, and electricity, and all these other things. And then we go and we say, hey, would you like to use our computers? Put in your name and your email, and a password. And you can start using our computers. And the VC says to me, what about the credit card? And I said, yeah, we don't care. And he goes, but people can steal from you. And that would be bad. And I'm thinking to myself, look at this fucking ugly website. No one's going to think we have that many computers anyway. I mean, it's kind of late. Um, if the biggest problem I have is too many people are coming in and stealing my resources, I would love to have that problem. 
The problem I think I'm going to have is I'm going to put this web page up and nobody's going to come. So all I want to do is get you to give me your fucking email address. That's all I really want. Like all the rest of this stuff, this actually got added later, this got added later, you know, this got added later. It used to be like, what's your name? Give me your email, create a password. Uh, I argued it didn't even need this. I said, give me your email, sign up, I'll send you a password. I'll make one up for you. But everyone's like, oh, that's horrible. People want to have a password they can remember. And I was like, really? I don't know, maybe we can give them a place later where they can change their password, right? Like, do I really need to make you f fill out, you know, some eight character letter number combination thing twice? Like, just fucking sign up already. So, uh, I believe that one of the best things about creating the company and doing the paperwork to actually be officially a corporation is it gives you permission to, to, to lose infinite amounts of money. Because now you have a corporation that protects you from people suing you. So a corporation is really permission to take more risk. It's a permission to be even crazier. Because when I was running the website by myself, you would sue me. But once I had a company, you only sue my company, and my company doesn't have any money. So I win. Uh, so I'm a big fan of like, just take more risk, do it faster, be, you know, stupid, don't be really, you know, sophisticated, make things simple. Um, and that that's sort of how you get started. Because every other step in here is one more thing that may make someone decide not to sign up. And, uh, you know, it's me and Arthur. We just want people to sign up. <clears throat> there's no policy, there's no lawyers. Um, I had another fun one. So again, this is version one of our website. Um, every website you will ever go to will have a little link down here that says user agreements, and especially in Europe, another link that says privacy policy. We don't have any of those. And the investor again says, you don't have a user agreement and you're going to take money from people. I said, yeah, it's okay. Like, if, if they want to say, hey, you didn't have an agreement, I want the money back, I'll give them the money back. Like, it's not that much money right now anyway, who cares? Uh, and they're like, oh, privacy policy, you're selling the businesses, they're going to be very concerned about privacy policy. I said, okay, let's find out. You know, a thousand customers have signed up, one person asked where our privacy policy was. We didn't have one, so I went to Wikia, the old company I used to work at, I found their page on privacy policy, I hit copy, I went to our site, I hit paste. Now we had a privacy policy. They're like, isn't a lawyer supposed to look at that? I'm like, I don't know, it's probably wrong. Who cares? Uh, and to be honest with you, you know where I learned this? I learned this from a, a publicly traded company called Yahoo. So when I was at eBay, and eBay was about to go public, Yahoo decides auctions are cool. We should do auctions also. So in two months, they built a copy of eBay and they launched Yahoo Auctions. And we're going through it because this is really scary. This is a big company and it looks very similar to our site. In fact, it has the same spelling mistakes our site has. Like, they literally copied and pasted 5,000 pages and then changed like the size of the buttons and the logo. I mean, it was amazing how little work they did. So if, if Yahoo can do it, why the fuck can't we? I mean, like, it's, it, it's really remarkable that, you know, people are like, oh, it's scary, no privacy policy. I don't know. Has anyone here ever read a privacy policy? Yeah, I, I, I joke that I spend $100 a month to carry around in my pocket a device that tells the government where I am all the time. It's called a phone. I believe that the, that the United States National Security Agency probably has a way to turn on the microphone on my iPhone whenever they want. So I decided there is no privacy, but I'm an American, we're kind of stupid that way. Um, so, now what does it take to start a company? You know, I'm talking about how easy it is, and blah, 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 blah. Um, ultimately, I argue it's just about storytelling. You're telling a story of some future that you imagine to be true. I believe someday everyone will 
And who do I tell this story to? Well, usually I'm trying to recruit someone. And so I'm telling them how I'm going to make the future different than it is today. Here's the story. We're going to be amazing. We're going to change the future. And then I launch my website, and I try to convince customers that my story is true. And then I take these employees who I've told this story that's not entirely true, but maybe will be in the future. And I take these customers who believe my story that isn't really true, but maybe someday in the future, and I use these lies to convince investors to give me money so I can go lie to more employees and lie to more customers and keep going. And in the US, this sort of system is called a Ponzi scheme. The only difference in startups is sometimes it actually works, because it turns out sometimes it wasn't a lie. Sometimes my vision of the future was actually true. But nine times out of 10, it actually was a lie. And, and I can tell you, you know, sitting as the CEO of IKEA, we had millions of dollars in the bank. We have, at that point, 50 employees. And I'm, I'm recruiting people, and I'm sitting in interviews with people, telling them how the future is going to be amazing. And I would go home and I would call my sister and I would say, I feel like I lied to someone today because I'm not sure I believe the future is as good as I told them. But it actually kind of makes me feel kind of sad some days that, you know, I don't feel good about what I'm saying. And she's like, oh, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And, you know, it turned out it worked out. But it's very hard, right? You're always telling this vision of the future that you believe. But no one else really believes it. Right? They don't believe it the way you believe it. Um, founder quotes on this. In the early days, everyone was a critic. My mom was embarrassed the first two years. Like, forget my friends, forget any investors that thought I was an idiot. My own mom didn't want to tell people what I did because she thought I was an idiot. That is from Craig Newmark, who started Craigslist. Uh, which is now doing, I don't know, like $100 billion a year in revenue with 17 people. Um, this is another one of my favorite ones. People are like, you're an overnight success. You've been amazing. You know, why should you go like this? He goes, five years later, I'm an overnight success. Like, no one remembers the 1,800 days of everyone telling me I was an idiot. No one trusting me. And I had to just keep saying, no, really, it'll work out. Um, and I felt that way a lot at Makia, right? After five years, we suddenly broke into the press and became really cool. And people were like, oh, it's so easy. You took a copy of Wikipedia software and like did some other weird shit with it. And I was like, yeah, for five years in a row. Um, and, and in a funny way, Silicon Valley is full of a lot of people who go to like Harvard Business School because they decide they want to become rich. And I really hate hiring people from Harvard Business School to join very small startups. And the reason why is for the first five years they're at my startup, they're going to go to a very expensive bar on the weekend and hang out with their friends who have cool clothes and are at Google or Goldman Sachs. And they're at a company no one's ever heard of. And they get depressed and then they drink more $18 cocktails, and then they get more depressed, and then they quit because they have better choices. There are other things they can do that are more fun. Like, being a startup in the early days is not fun. It's hard, it's painful, it's stressful, and the best people who do it do it because they really believe they're going to change the future. They really believe that they can do something interesting. And they're okay with five years of toiling away in the basement. Uh, so last year I decided to do something crazy. To give you an example of starting companies, I went around to all my friends and I said, my plan in 2012 is to start eight companies. It's going to be awesome. And every single one of my friends looked at me and said, you are the stupidest person I have ever met. Like, that's actually, that's not crazy. That's just stupid. I said, well, I figure I can do about two every, every quarter, two every three months. And for each of these companies, I will find some other crazy person to be my co-founder. Because I know lots of people, I know lots of people who want to be a startup. I know lots of people who would like to found a startup, but they don't have the money, they don't have the idea, they don't have the courage. 
So I'll help do that, and I'll have a partner for each of these so I don't have to be the CEO. So my goal is I get a CEO for each of them. I help out. I'll be like the junior founder, which is fine. Like I don't care about titles. Uh, and then I'll find out what doesn't work. So it'll be awesome. And my friends are like, you'll fail. And I said, yes. My goal is to fail. The question is, can I get halfway? Like, that would be an awesome failure to start four companies this year, wouldn't it? Like, that would not be so bad. So what happened a year later? I missed my goal. I started five. Um, and it turned out storytelling, again, was the key. I kept telling stories to people. I kept hearing about why this idea was stupid. And I love it when people criticize my idea. It's one thing when they say it's stupid. It's another thing when they start telling me what's wrong with it. I love when people tell me what's wrong with my idea because it means they care about my idea enough to criticize it. The people who don't care tell me I'm stupid and go get a beer. So I love criticism. I love people telling me, you know, that you haven't thought about this, and this will never work, you should try that, and the next thing you know, you're the CEO of the company. Um, but it was really, it was all about storytelling. Like, it, like, we could do this, it could work, I could raise money for it. None of these statements were true at the beginning, but some of them became true. So, results today, we started five, two of them have already failed, they're dead. Um, two of them were lightly funded, we raised a little bit of money for them. Uh, my big mistake on one of these two, one of them had a founder, one of them did not have a founder. One of them, I was talking to like six people who all thought it was cool and wanted to help. But no one wanted to quit their job and do it, and I got impatient. And it turns out being impatient was a very bad decision, because we raised some money for a company that had no employees, and no founder, and no one was in charge, and on weekends we would trade emails and do projects. And we launched the website despite this, but it really never went anywhere. So one of my mistakes was breaking my rule of there has to be a CEO founder that isn't me. Because I found out if there isn't a CEO founder, I'm the founder, and that's a problem because I'm really bad in details. Uh, and one of them actually has done quite well, fastly, um, raised now three rounds of funding. It's gone from me and Arthur to about 35 people, generating about three, four million dollars a year right now in revenue. Uh, looking pretty cool. So, you know, you can look at it, you can say, I totally failed, like I missed the goal, I made two horrible mistakes, I made one really pretty bad mistake of bad judgment, I made one, meh, who cares, and only one of my ideas was actually even a little successful. So you can say I'm a total failure, because I now own a huge chunk of a venture-funded company that's going like this. Like, if that's the definition of failure, and at big companies, this is the definition of you failed and you should probably be fired. Because failure is not acceptable at big companies. Failure is not acceptable if you're in politics. But in venture land, failure is fantastic. Right? I failed four times out of five. In baseball, that's pretty good. If I miss four out of five balls. In soccer or in football, if you miss four out of five shots on goal, that's still probably pretty good. So, you know, I told you a bit about what went wrong. Part-time founder, really bad. Uh, turns out, single founder is also pretty bad because this job is lonely and stressful. Two to three people really sort of makes it a little more social and fun. It's more like our club in my mom's basement instead of me alone in my mom's basement. Um, not having money causes a lot of stress. Um, so either plan for no money and build it in the basement or raise as much as you can. Uh, sometimes I didn't raise enough money, that, that was stupid. Uh, and this is my favorite one, launch early. I would have fights with my co-founder, he says, it's not ready. I said, yes, that's why we're launching. He says, but it's not ready and it's going to be embarrassing. And I said, to no customers, which is what we will have. And he's like, but it's not ready. What if the press writes about how bad it is? And I said, I trust me, no press is going to write about our launch because no customers are going to come to our launch because no one fucking cares about our launch. Let's just launch. Um, what if people get angry? 
Uh, seriously, I can't overstate this. Customer anger. People will be angry. They will criticize me. They will say, what a retarded, bad, stupid, not working website you built or service you built. I love anger. It means people care. What I hate is people coming and leaving and not being angry at how much I suck. Because they'll never come back. You know, anger is not your enemy. Embarrassment is not the enemy. Apathy is the enemy. Apathy is no one cares. Apathy is when you tell a joke and no one even knows it's a joke. <laughs> what matters is stamina, right? Just being able to do it again and again. To wake up every morning and have people hit you, right? And tell you you're stupid and tell you why it's a bad idea and wonder why you're not doing something better with your life and working till 2 a.m. and then 3 a.m. and then 4 a.m. over and over and over again because you know there's, there's this great famous saying from politics which is the only thing that's ever changed the world is a small group of very passionate people right it's the only thing that ever does so, you know, I think nothing went wrong with my process. I learned that very few of my ideas were great. And I learned that this Darwinian process of killing things, you know, killing things that don't work also worked. So from my perspective, you know, my little project worked perfectly. Uh, so my argument is it's time to start something and, you know, you guys should all get out of your chairs and have something up and running by the end of the night. So, you know, ask questions or just leave and get to work. Want to do uh, Q and A? Yes. Do you have any questions? So, is there any experience that you can implement from these companies to start up? Yeah. So, most big company experience is useful once the product works. We in, in the U.S. they call it product market fit. When you find the product that customers want to buy, now you have to become a company. And that, that's the point where big company people are helpful because then you have to do things like hiring 25 salespeople or building an engineering team that actually functions together. Um, I was talking to a guy who is managing a thousand servers and he said, I used to manage one server. It was very easy. When it, I had a problem, I would kick it and I would fix it. And now I manage a thousand servers and I have to build systems and processes and alerting and software because I can't manage one server. There's just too many of them. So I find that big company people are very helpful for starting to build that process. But if you bring them in too soon, they get very, very uncomfortable with the lack of you know, structure, with the lack of data, with uh, having to make decisions without actually knowing you know, half of the data I would need to make a decision. Um, sometimes they're helpful for fundraising, you bring them in and you sort of put them in the window for investors and then you, but uh, you know, I, I think it's just a very different thing, it's, it's, you know, in a funny way that really big company people are a lot like people who grew up in the communist system. They're used to going to the factory and turning the knob and pulling the dial and then going home. Um, and so I was joking with, with someone at the, the Happy Farm yesterday that a big company is like an escalator. You get on the escalator, you go off to the second floor, and you get off. You know where you're going, it's nice and smooth, I can drink my coffee while I'm on the escalator. And being in a startup is like being on a roller coaster. You go upside down, you go really fast, you don't know where the end is, usually your stomach hurts by the end of it. Like, it's just different, right? And people who want an escalator really don't like roller coasters. Um, so they have their place. It's, it's sort of stage two, right, when you're trying to grow. What else? Oh, uh, what can you say about uh, such instrument, how to uh, find, uh, how to find investors like uh, two minutes in elevator? Uh, you know, this, uh, elevator speech. Yeah, yeah. You want me to talk well, about you, what, what the you, elevator pitch is? Uh, can you give some uh, key advices uh, on yes. how, how to manage with this? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, what is an elevator pitch and how do you make an awesome elevator pitch? 
Uh, the elevator pitch is you get in the elevator with uh, some important investor and you have 52 floors before the elevator door opens to quickly tell them your story and get money from them. Uh, it's been done. Uh, I actually talked to a guy who went to a party and in like five minutes got a check from someone. So it, it happens. Um, so I have a couple answers. One is it has to be very fast. The other is the best elevator pitch has been tried on a hundred people. And you start to listen for like when they lean in and when they sort of start leaning back and closing their eyes. Like the best elevator pitch is never right the first time. It's constant practice and finding out what makes people excited. And in terms of the pieces that go into it, it generally sounds something like this. The world has changed. Something is different now. I am the only person who realized it. And I have this magic product that everyone will love. And there are two billion people on the internet who will buy it from me. Please give me money. <laughs> yeah, no, so uh, I was telling a friend of mine, uh, I forget which month it was last year, but uh, I did two investments in one month. One of them was a company that had a product, had customers, had revenue, was growing 10 to 15 percent a month, had a team of very experienced engineers. And they raised money from me at a $1.5 million valuation. So we said, this company is worth $1.5 million, now we will buy some stock in it. The other company I invested in had a founder who can't program, who had his last business had failed, who didn't have a product yet, who promised the team would quit if he raised money, so they hadn't even sort of taken this jump of quitting ahead of time. And he raised money from me and my friends at a $20 million valuation. And you think, like, how does that work? Like, that's crazy, right? But he had this fantastic elevator pitch. He said, I was working on this gambling company in the UK, and we failed because acquiring customers for our casino was very expensive. I realized spending money to acquire customers sucks, but I have this failed company that has all these licenses for gambling. I have this new idea. I will let anyone build a gambling service on top of whatever service they're running. If you have a card game on iPhone, you can add real money gambling. If you have a horse race game, you can add real money gambling. If you play World of Warcraft, now you can gamble over who will win the, the, the fight in World of Warcraft. And, I, and gambling is a big market. And I was like, I love it. I'm in. Like, just tell me where to write the check. Like, you're going to enable people to gamble on everything, everywhere, all the time. Uh-huh. Like, how can I help you recruit? This is fantastic. Like, I love it. It's going to be horrible for the world, but we're going to make so much money. So, you know, I expect in a year or two, you know, you'll be gambling on your iPhone all the time and you'll be laughing really, really loud. Other questions? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you for the presentations. It was well, it was lovely. Um, can you give us three advices on what we as a startup or as a nascent startup should not do in our startup careers? Three in what period? Uh, startup career. If you, so career. If you, if you look at your experience, it's your life. Yeah. Yeah. So what I have to find three. Three pieces of advice on what not to do in your startup career. Um, interesting. So, right, if, if you listen to a lot of what I say, it's like, listen to customers, collect data, make lots of mistakes. One of the worst things you can do is be one of those people who knows all the answers. Thank you. I don't, I really don't. I mean, I just had a, interview with a reporter who said, you know, hey, we hear you made a lot of mistakes at Wikia. I said, oh, I made a lot of mistakes at Wikia. Like, I have a long list of mistakes. Um, it's the, the opposite of knowing every answer is to be humble and curious. 
right? To be open to the fact that you can fail, to always be listening and learning. And, and that's what this hypothesis testing is about, right? It's saying, I have a vision. I don't know how to get I don't know how to get there. Like I don't know how. But I believe we will get there. A friend of mine calls it bending the universe. I like that sounds cool. I want to do that. Um, so being arrogant and telling people you know all the answers. So the worst um, entrepreneurs come to me and they have this presentation where they say, I have no competitors, I have all the answers, you know, and uh, you know, we've been perfect, we've done everything perfectly, and here's our perfect plan for the future. And I go, yeah, I don't really trust you, right? And I don't really feel like when things are hard and we're having to have hard conversations that you will be honest with me. Um, because you need to have hard conversations sometimes. So I believe being, being humble, listening, not being arrogant, certainly is one thing. Because at the end of the day, it's me in the basement. The guy at IBM has like all of this power and this big office space and fancy suits. He can be arrogant and it's okay. If I'm arrogant, that's really bad. It's bad for recruiting, pisses off customers, irritates investors. So that's one. Uh, the second is fear. Um, fear of failure, fear of being embarrassed, fear that the product isn't good enough. Um, you know, you, you just have to sort of get over it and be like, it's going to suck and it's going to be ugly and people are going to hate it and my mom is going to be embarrassed. And once you kind of get to that point, life is really fun, right? Because you're not afraid of anything. Um, it's the reason I'm always telling people, I always start conversations with all the things I do wrong or all the mistakes I've made. Because then it's, you know, it's just easier to set expectations low, right? People expect very little from me. Uh, the last time I raised money for Wikia, our presentation started with all the things we had fucked up. A long, long list of things we had fucked up. And then it showed user growth. And it was a bit of a marketing gimmick in this case, but what I was really telling people was the product is working despite the fact that me and my 10 friends in this room are fucking morons doing everything wrong. If you give us money, imagine how awesome this business will be when we go from being incompetent to merely okay. Like, we don't have to be geniuses. We don't have to be rocket scientists. This business is going to be awesome if we can go from being stupid to like marginally competent. Like, that doesn't sound like that scary an investment to me. Like, I would invest in something like that. Uh, so that's two. I'm trying to figure out if I can get a third one. Um, I'm not sure I have a good third one. Uh, well, I go back to something I said earlier. Uh, when money is available, always take money. Uh, John Doerr, who is the, one of the most famous VCs, uh, partner at Kleiner Perkins, one of the best venture firms in the Valley, has this fantastic quote that he says, it's like a comedian, he says it with a straight face and everyone laughs. He says, no startup has ever failed from having too much money. <laughs> and I actually think he's wrong, but it's the startup that raised $300 million from Intel and SAP and hired the first 200 people out of Intel and SAP who failed because it was just colossally bad people with too much money. So it is possible to fail from too much money, but it's really hard to fail from too much money. So I often worry that, oh, I'm going to get diluted, or the price isn't good enough, if I wait, I can get more money, a better price, and then I have to stop and go, just take the money. Like, I can always fix other problems later, but let's go. So, there's three. Who else? But is it okay to take money from everybody? Like, there are different kinds is, of Is it okay to take money from everybody? Yeah, again, I have my pyramid. I want smart, nice people who uh, will give me lots of money at great terms. Uh, and I don't want the crazy doctor guy. And I don't want investors who have total control over my company for the first $5 they put in. 
But ultimately, if I need five dollars, or I'm going to fail, I will give them control of the company because my other choice is to not have a company. And my argument, and it's hard to remember this in the moment, uh, believe me, I've been there, and I've made mistakes doing this, it's hard to remember this isn't the only company you will ever have, and that this isn't the only good idea you will ever have. And once you sort of go, okay, it's just like one of these things I will do in my life, right? It becomes much easier to let go of these things. I mean, it's sort of like if every first date is like, will he be my husband? Versus every first date is like, did I have fun and did he pay for dinner? Right? Like, if you set the expectations too high, um, it's really stressful. And, and so my argument is always you take the best money you can on the best prices, on the best people, with the best legal terms. But my goal is to raise a certain amount of money, and I'm going to go raise that from the best available from whatever pile of shit shows up at my door. There's someone in this yes, sir. Uh, if you ask, if you are just listening to the agent, they suddenly think, yeah, yes, well, what about if you have some kind of obligation, you have family experience, etc. How do you uh, propose to manage, uh, or maybe your personal experience, manage those obligations? How do I start a company if I have a family and a mortgage and all of this stuff that sucks? Uh, it's one of the reasons most startups are founded by 20-year-olds. And the best startups don't get an office, they get an apartment, and they all live together and they never leave. They sleep in the same building, they eat in the same building, and they don't leave. Um, very few startups are successfully founded by 40-year-olds like me. Um, there's a reason why I have choices. There are other things I can do. Um, that said, there's nothing preventing you from starting something at home in your spare time. I have hobbies, it's called starting companies. I don't see, I don't golf, I don't really do much other than work because I really love it. I'm one of those crazy Americans that you know, live to work. I don't work in order to live. I live in order to work. Um, so all it, you know, you, you work at a big company, you work 40 hours a week, you work 50 hours a week. Turns out you have 168 hours in a week. So when I left school with my travel website, I took a job at a big company that agreed to move me out to San Francisco. And I worked 35 hours a week at my 40 hour a week job. My goal was to not be fired. It wasn't to be awesome. And I probably put 60 hours a week into my startup. So I was working 90 hour weeks. My girlfriend really didn't like that. Uh, but it's okay. You know, she'll, she'll recover. Um, so you can do it, right? It doesn't require a lot of money. It doesn't have to be full time. You're learning. You're doing an experiment. You're trying out a crazy idea. Most of the time it fails. Oh well. Some of the times it becomes what we in the Valley call a lifestyle business, which is this really stupid way of describing businesses that generate enough cash to buy a ton of beer and pizza, but will never become a billion dollar company. Like, I had a lifestyle business, my travel website, but it was $80,000 a year for like three hours a week of work by the end. Like, I'd like to have a few of those. That would be okay. So, you know, you know and on the long way, you learn a ton. So, my argument is, you can, you just choose not to. From your experience, um, would you like to share with the shares? So the question is, the investor comes to me and asks to get 50% of my company for $5, is that fair? Um, and, and I have many answers to it, because it's not an easy question, right? I go back to my two investments where the one that was further along and had revenue got a lower valuation than the one that had no team and no product and got a higher valuation. 
So part of the answer is it's more like cooking than math. There is a recipe, but it's not really entirely analytic. There's a, there's a lot of emotion that goes into it. There's a lot of guessing that goes into it. But there are some rules. So in Silicon Valley today, the typical first round investor, let's see, the typical first round investment might be a half a million to a million dollars where the company is valued at four to five to six million. So if you take a half a million on five million valuation, you're giving up 10% of the company to raise about a half a million dollars. Um, and then you raise, then, or you go and raise venture capital, and the venture capital rule, every VC I talk to says, we must own 20%. It doesn't matter what the check is, 20% or something. I'm busy. Uh, I just went through one of those fights with a VC and we were like, we can give you 18. And he's like, I don't know how to spell 18. I only know how to spell 20. 20 has fewer letters. Give me 20. I'm like, sir, you get 18. Um, Europe tends to be, at least Western Europe, tends to be a little more conservative. Uh, typical first round in Europe can be 30%. Um, I've seen a lot of European companies that have 30% in the first round, 30% in the second round. Um, incubators, I've seen, you know, Y Combinator that typically takes 6%. I saw a Polish incubator that takes 35%. Why? I don't know. Uh, because, like, if I had the choice between the Polish incubator or Y Combinator, I would pick Y Combinator because they're awesome. So why do they charge less than the one that isn't awesome? Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, but as a general rule of thumb, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, something in that range is normal. Uh, the wee hearted founder sold the majority of his company in the first round. He didn't really have another choice. His other choice was, I have to turn off the website because too many people are visiting. I'm sad for him. On the other hand, as an investor, my goal is to make him rich enough that I won't be too sad for too long. Um, but I generally, as an entrepreneur, try to avoid other people having more than 50% of the company because it makes me sad. Uh, it makes me sad because then I actually have to listen to them. When I own 51% of the company, I can say, ha ha, I'm in charge, and go back to work. So, yes. What does it take for a company to be successful financially? Uh, the general bullshit answer in Silicon Valley is I want to go public. And to go public, I have to have between 50 million and 100 million in revenue and be growing pretty quickly. And I'd like to get there in typically seven to eight years. The best guys do it in three. Um, so eBay was about three years to go to public. Google was more like five or six. Uh, Facebook could have gone public probably in three or four, but it took longer because they didn't like being public. Uh, so that's one metric. The other metric is very different, which is I have enough money to quit my job. I have enough money that we can actually turn a profit and now we get to decide what we're going to do instead of always having to raise money in order to do what we want to do. So that's the other way I look at it, is I love businesses where I get to, you know, build a real business with real revenue and have profits, because then I own my decisions and my destiny. And that number can be very small, right? I mean, when I'm working at home, I, had to, I needed $240 a year in revenue to get the profitability for my travel business. But that was pretty easy. What else? So, yes, sir. Uh, can you give some advice about uh, choosing the domain name? Choosing the domain name. How do you choose a domain name? Uh, all of the good ones are gone. Uh, it sucks. Um, I, I like the dominant domain of the country. So in the US, I only use .com. You know, out here I use .com.ua, I guess. Okay, good. Um, I like 
like shorter names that mean nothing over longer names that mean something. Um, but I also ultimately believe that it's all about just getting out there and like waving my hands around. So I will often just like do a brainstorming session for an hour, come up with eight bad names, throw darts, pick one, buy it, move on. Next problem. Um, people go, yeah, but your brand is some horrible blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's true. And if you go back and you read the history books, for the first year, eBay's domain name was auctionweb.com, which is a fucking terrible name. And then they started making money, and they could have hired a marketing consultant, and they found this stupid name that means nothing in every language in the world except Russian, where it means you got screwed. So it's a terrible name for an auction site in Russia. Uh, but they fixed it later, right? So I like short, I like spellable, like uh, my favorite bad eBay name. They started a classified site, and they called it Kijiji. K-I-J-I-J-I. -I -I. When you look at it, it's like da 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 da. I couldn't tell where the I's and the J's were. Like they kind of look the same. And they're like, it's an African word. It means trust in Swahili. I'm like, can we just call it eBayClassifieds.com for now? They're like, no, it's Swahili. It's really cool. You know, my answer is, there are no good ones left. For, you know, make your best guess. Buy one that people know how to type in. You know, don't buy .in or .ly or .co or .whatever the fuck the, the new one is. The faster guys can tell you we need to buy fast.ly, but we have fastly.com. I'm like, why do I have to buy the worst one? I have the better one already. Like, I don't understand. Like fast out of the lie, it's cool. So, you know, my answer is uh, it's marketing, right? There's no science. You do the best you can and move on. My main goal is not to spend a lot of time worrying about it because I have much bigger problems uh, early on. What else? Someone in the back. Come on. I can ask, what is similar in valuable ideas? So, what idea is valuable? How can you understand? What domain is available? No, no. Valuable. My idea is valuable. What an idea is valuable. No idea is ever valuable. Um, you know, it's the old Einstein quote, which is genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Right? It's, it's like when you told me you were going to let people buy and sell things over the internet, people would mail each other checks and other people would send the shit. Every smart person I talked to said that was completely stupid. That will never work. People will be cheated. There are crooks everywhere. Like, so I argue that all ideas are stupid until I have data. And so as, a, as an angel investor, I don't invest in ideas anymore because it is so cheap to turn your idea into data. If you haven't done it, you're a bad entrepreneur. If you come to me with PowerPoints and you haven't done a consumer survey and spent 50 bucks on Google driving people to a survey or to a, a fake page where they can buy something to see how many people actually buy it, you know, I don't care if it's soap or a website, but you can still run a $50 survey and find out if anyone wants your soap. So if you haven't done these sorts of things that show you care more than I do, that doesn't sound very good to me. I don't want to be the guy who cares more about your business than you do. So I quickly get to, it's about data, it's about customers, it's about showing growth. That's what I increasingly look for. Also my question was, what is similar to good ideas from your experience? What is similar, what is similar about good ideas? Uh, the best ideas tend to be very simple. They don't have lots of moving parts and lots of functions. They do one thing. Simple, easy, fast, and 99 people out of 100 that you tell them to will say they're completely stupid. Because if it was obvious, like you could make money opening up a coffee shop, someone's probably already done it. So boring ideas are kind of stupid. 
Now, if that thing stops Starbucks from making a lot of money, so I'm wrong, apparently. Um, but I'd much rather bet on someone who wants to do something that's really interesting and new than someone who wants to build a 50-second site where I can post photos. Because there are a lot of places I can post photos. Again, I was wrong. Instagram sells for a billion dollars. They let you put up photos on the internet. So I'm not perfect, but one of my rules of thumb is if lots of people are already doing it, like, why are you doing it also? Do something new. Anyone else? Everyone's those who like to need more caffeine, so I'm happy to stop talking or keep answering questions. Anyone? All right. Thanks for done. Thank you.